on, yeah. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to our Facebook Live. It is Friday, March 3rd, 2023. And we have a very, very special guest with us today. And it's none other than my father, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. And I'm going to be referring to him as Essie during our conversation today. Let us, let us know where you're uh, tuning in from. And also, if you're interested in how you can prevent and reverse heart disease, throw a little heart in your comment for us today. We would, uh, we would love that. So, uh, Essie, how are you doing today? This is the day. This is exciting. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm in Austin, Texas. You're in Cleveland, Ohio. It's about 73 degrees here. What's it like there? About 45. 45. Is that that? Ergo, you have the sweater on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, gang, our, our goal here today, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard my father's lecture on preventing and reversing heart disease. And so we're not going to go into all that. But what I want to do is talk about the nine different ways over the course of his last 39 years of research, the way that he has been able to show that you can, in fact, uh, show reversal of coronary artery disease. But Essie, before we jump into that, I'd like to ask you this. Could you explain to everybody that's tuning in today what was your profession at the Cleveland Clinic before you decided to get into showing reversal of heart disease? Well, the thing that was the springboard for me was that uh, I was, for a number of years, I was chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force. And I, there came a, came a point in late 1979, 1980, that I became increasingly <clears throat> disillusioned. The fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsus uh, unsuspecting victim. So this uh, sort of motivated, motivated me to do a um, sort of a global bit of research. And sure enough, there were multiple cultures where breast cancer rates were, you know, 30 to four times less frequent than in the United States. And in rural Japan in the 1950s, uh, breast cancer was very infrequently seen. Yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate, to the United States, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And in the 1958, in 1958, in the entire nation, autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate. 18, probably the most mind boggling health figure I think I've ever encountered. But by 1978, 20 years later, they were up to 137 which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 men who will die of prostate cancer in this country this year. So as the, my research went on of, of more of this global pattern, it was quite apparent that I was encountering multiple cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. Okinawa, rural China, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in Northern Mexico, the Papua Highlands in New Guinea, no heart disease. What's going on here? So suddenly it dawned on me that we really would be more bang for the buck if we could really look at the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, which is heart disease. Because if we could get people to, <clears throat> to eat to save their heart, it was clearly apparent that they would markedly diminish the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic. So that was kind of the background that motivated <laughs> to say it's time to see if we can't do some research in heart disease and see if we can get people who have heart disease to, to transition to whole food plant-based nutrition and see if we can either stop or perhaps even reverse their disease. And so how confident were you when you set out with your first cohort, cohort of 22 patients that you could in fact show that you could reverse heart disease? Well, the epidemiological studies that I've just reviewed with you gave me a fair amount of, uh, of confidence that this was something that was uh, perhaps had a great chance of working. The, 
the real challenge was to see what we could do to get people to cling to this type of dietary nutrition and change. So when you say cling, you mean uh, kind of the bedrock of their success was on if, if you could make them compliant? Uh, totally. That was, in, in, in other words, without compliance, you had nothing. And so why do you feel with your patients and your program, you had such compliance? Well, I think the, uh, the most important thing of all is to show the patient uh, respect. And the, uh, if you're going to show a patient respect, I mean, you're going to give them your time. And my f friend, Bert Dunphy, who was a well-known West Coast surgeon, used to say that uh, the patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer, but patients with cancer are not afraid to die. So truly, uh, what is the key thing here is to show the patients that you believe in what you're doing. And I must confess that for the first uh, five years, I was so uh, apprehensive. Actually, the first, uh, yes, the first five years, I was so apprehensive about not having compliance that I was seeing these patients uh, every two weeks and we would check their cholesterol and their blood pressure and their weight. And after uh, doing this for, for, uh, uh, for five years, I then graduated and we did it for, <clears throat> I was seeing them then uh, every month. And, uh, and then after 10 years of the study, now they were pretty well on autopilot and I transitioned to seeing them on a quarterly basis. But that was really effective because it meant that they, uh, they continued to stick with the program. And that's why we began to get these amazing results. Not only did we halt disease progression, but as we'll see later today on yeah. this program, uh, we can show how there are striking examples of disease reversal. Now, you started, you started your research in 1984. And here you are, you know, you're a, you're a general surgeon. Your specialty is the thyroid, the parathyroid, and breast. How, how did that conversation go with whoever you had to get permission with to start doing this research with heart disease? And how, how many days a week did you start doing this research? Well, <laughs> well that, that wasn't, I, I was really uh, still obligated with all my surgical responsibilities. So the initial group was really rather uh, uh, small. It was 24 patients. And I knew within the first uh, month that there were six guys, nice guys, who just quite didn't uh, understand or get it. So we had the eight, we had these 18 patients that were the nucleus and they st were the ones that stayed with us for over 12 years. And what was rather striking about it was those 18 patients, I wanted to follow up how many uh, coronary events of disease progression had they had in the eight years prior to coming into our study while they were in the hands of expert mm -hmm. cardiologists. And they, interestingly enough, those 18 patients had 49 events of increasing or progressive disease. However, combined. that's combined. Yep, 49 was combined. But once they came into our program, 17 of those 18 over the next 12 years had zero disease progression. And we often had striking examples of disease reversal. There was one patient who failed because after six years, he got back into the French fries lamb chops, glazed donuts, mm. ended up having a bypass. But now I'm happy to say he's back with the flock, but proves the point that I'm trying to share today. Yeah. And so uh, how many days a week were you devoting to this research? Was this one day a week, two days a week? Yeah, it was once a week. Once a week. Okay. Now I, I want everybody listening to know that I know I'm sure that many of you have a lot of questions and so we're going to reserve those uh, for about another 20 minutes. Um, first, though, I, I would love for Essie to actually go through to help uh, highlight the points that we're trying to make here with reversal of cardiovascular disease. We have some slides that will help make that point. And so, Essie, I'd love for you to drive with Bess, our producer, if you think this is a good time for you to start showing some of those slides and talking about the nine ways that you've shown reversal. 
Yeah, I think before we get into that, it would be yeah. important to perhaps uh, mention, because probably people are wondering, why is it <laughs> that when you, that when you tra transition to whole food, plant-based nutrition, why is it that these changes occur? And I think to, uh, to put some solid ground uh, under that, I think all experts would agree that where this disease has its initiating, uh, that is its causation, inception, its beginning, is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which happens to be that delicate innermost lining of the artery called the endothelium. And the endothelium manufactures a truly magic molecule of gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is really quite remarkable because it is responsible for the salvation, preservation, and protection of all of our blood vessels because of these remarkable functions that nitric oxide possesses. For example, nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements within the bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide has the strongest, is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate. That's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff, or inflamed. Hmm. Protect us from getting high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages and plaque. So Lindy, when you think about it, every single person on the planet who has cardiovascular disease has their disease because by now, in the previous decades, they have so se severe, severely trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into a train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages and plaque. So. Hmm. This is, as we said, this, uh, the key here is to understand that you want to restore the capacity of your endothelial cells to make nitric oxide. Because when that happens, when that happens, there is no disease <clears throat> progression, and we often will see significant elements of disease reversal. Now, I don't know if you want to do it now, Rip, or not, but we could, should mention what are the foods that every time they pass your lips, you injure the endothelial cell. I would, I would love that. Before we do that, I, I want to ask you this. So we have a range of people probably from 22 to 95 that are on this, uh, on this live call right now. Is it ever too late to start eating this way to bring those endothelial cells back to life? Absolutely not. Let me give you an example. The oldest patient I started with was 87. He came to see me because he had been told he had to have bypass surgery. But he was convinced that when they sawed him in half for this bypass surgery, uh, he would die. He would, would not survive that. So he said, no, I'm not going to have the bypass. I'm going to go with your whole food plant-based approach. And every six months or so, he would give us a call, let us know how he was doing. And then it was just about six months ago that my wife, Anne, got a call. <laughs> and it was Stanley. And he was asking her, what kind of a recipe should I use? Because I'm going to have a party of, tw of 20 people. And he sa uh, uh, so he said, uh, I really want you to know that the reason I'm having the party is I'm celebrating my 100th birthday. <laughs> really? So wait, can I repeat what I think I heard? So Stanley came to you 13 years ago. That's it. 13 years ago, because he didn't want to have his, his chest sawed in half because he didn't think that that was a good idea and he probably wouldn't live too much longer. And he went on your program and he's now a hundred years old and he's, he's going to be cooking <laughs> for a party of 20 guests. That's awesome. So what, what, what are the foods that you recommended Stanley eat? that uh, allowed him to go another 13 years. Well, I think what it really was was one of the foods that Stanley should not eat. Well, sure. I have to interrupt. Oh, uh, and, and everybody, just so you know, we also have Ann Kryle Esselstyn is in the house. Ann, what's up? 
Well, we, we I asked Jane what she would. We can't see because you, Anne. And Stanley, we can't, and we cannot having a party for about a hundred people, and we suggested Stanley have make sure that they used a hundred different plant based <laughs> product vegetables in yeah. the menu. <clears throat> Nice. That's nice. Well, Dr. Will Bolshewitz would be happy with that for sure. <laughs> All right. So, so Essie, what, what foods, well, how, 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 how do you want to direct this? Well, what foods should we eat and what foods should we stay away from? Well, let's just try to take what we should stay away from first. We want to be sure that we categorize here. What are the foods that every time they pass your lips, you will injure the endothelial cell. All right. They are one. Any drop of oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, mm -hmm. safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a chip, oil in a cracker, oil in a salad dressing, oil in a piece of bread. Oil injures endothelial cells. Now, for those who have doubts about what I've just said, I did publish an article in the uh, International Journal of Disease Reversal uh, and Prevention and the title of my editorial was, Is Oil Healthy? And in that article, I, re I review the animal studies and the human studies showing how oil injures the endothelial cells. Right. Now, uh, so in addition to oil, what's it going to be? It's, you have to also eliminate animal protein. That is to say, anything with a mother or a face, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs. Also, we want to eliminate dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. Be careful of sugary drinks. Be careful of sugary foods, cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. You wanna, I don't like people to have, who have severe heart disease not to have peanuts, peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, or avocado. And lastly, eliminate coffee with caffeine. Decaf, yes. Green tea, yes. Black tea, yes. So what are you going to eat? Hold on. Gonna, Before we go on, I, I have a feeling that you've, You've said that list once or twice before. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. What not, eat, what not eat? Okay. So what shall we eat? <laughs> yeah. That's so. What, what are you going to eat? All those marvelous whole grains. W h o l e. Whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels. A hundred and one different types of legumes, lentils, and beans. All these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables and some white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and uh, some fruit. Now, I must say that for patients who are seriously ill with heart disease, I made a modification about a decade ago. And the modification came about because of the awareness that the endothelial production of nitric oxide is age dependent. For example, you never have had a heard of an eight-year-old boy or a girl having a heart attack. No, they have nitric oxide coming out of their ears. But by the time they're age 50, beautifully healthy, they now have 50% of the nitric oxide they had when they were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you've lost 70%. So the change I made in our program was a greater stimulation, a greater stimulation of the endothelial production of nitric oxide. And most importantly, we embraced the newer research that shows us that mankind has an alternate pathway for making nitric oxide. So what is that pathway? I need these patients seriously ill with heart disease to chew, not smoothies, not juicing, to chew six times a day, a green leafy vegetable, approximately the size of half of your fist or a quarter of your fist, which um, after it has first been steamed for uh, five and a half to six minutes, so it's nice and tender. And then you must anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic or rice vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars can help restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme, which is contained within the endothelial cell and responsible for making nitric oxide. So you're going to chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your luncheon sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course I adore it when you have that evening snack of arugula or kale. <laughs> now, the second yeah. 
The second benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, it restores the capacity of your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cells, which can replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. Now, the third benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, most important, when you're chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew this green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the grips and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce that nitrate that you've been chewing to a nitrite. When you swallow the nitrite, it is now your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce that nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. So think about it. What you're doing for minimal expense with hid no hideous side effects all day long, dawn to dusk, morning to night, you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now, there is a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride or public drinking water with fluoride and mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And I do not like antacids because they will decrease your gastric acidity and you will be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Hmm. Now, the, the top six are green leafy vegetables are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. And if, and if you've got a half a second, I can go the rest of them. Uh, please do. And also Barry yeah. Casey, Barry Casey really wants you to do the greens wrap as well. <laughs> the whole list are bok, bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, snapper, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula and asparagus. And the reason I'd like to go through that with you like this is so that you understand that whole food plant-based nutrition can help maintain your memory. <laughs> Love it. All right. Will you, and again, everybody, um, we will do our best to get to your questions in uh, in just a little bit. So, Essie, do you want to start hitting some of these slides? We start with number one. Yeah, best if you could hit that up. Thanks. I'm going to show you a, several slides here of disease reversal. Now, this happens to be about as small as your naked eye can see, and I should share with you that these angiograms were all reviewed in the angiography core laboratory of the uh, Cleveland Clinic Department of Cardiology. So when I give you a percentage of improvement, I know that it's accurate. This was a 67-year-old uh, retired pediatrician. You're looking at the left anterior descending coronary artery. And when you measure from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, it was a 10% improvement. So wow. Essie, before you before you go on, just so we're clear with everybody, in case you've never seen something like this before, the slide on the left is the one before they started treatment with whole food plant based nutrition, correct? And the right. one on the right, it you can see it's opened up a little bit, and that's the so you have the before on the left and the after on the right. Correct. Let's go to number two. Now, this is what we call the circumflex artery that goes to the back of the heart in a 58-year-old factory worker. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right was defined as a 20% improvement. Let's go to the next one. This is a 54-year-old, uh, actually, uh, security guard. And you're looking at the right coronary artery. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right was described as a 30% improvement. Can we go to the next, please? Uh, this happens to be a different uh, patient. This is uh, actually his name is Dr. Joe Crow. He's in the first chapter of my book at age 44. Uh, he had had uh, a heart attack and he his cholesterol was 156. He was not hypertensive. He was not diabetic. He exercised regularly. He was not overweight. But you can see in this view of his left, ante left anterior descending coronary artery. This was the, uh, this was the uh, angiogram that was taken at the time of his heart attack. And you can see inside that yellow bracket that this lower third of the artery was all moth-eaten and diseased. Well, 
he has an interesting story. He, uh, uh, it was, as you can see here, it was over too long a segment to not be a candidate for stents. You simply can't pound in stent after stent after stent. And it was too far down the artery for bypass. So Joe felt that they really couldn't do very much for him. So uh, Ann and I had Joe and his wife out for supper two weeks after his uh, heart attack. And I said, look, come on, Joe, you've been eating this horrible Western diet. You've got the typical Western disease. Why don't you think about going plant-based? He said, okay, yes, I'll give it a shot. They really couldn't offer me anything else, but I'm not gonna take those statin drugs. I don't trust them, too many side effects. Fine, that's your call. Well, over the next two and a half years, he was the absolute personification of commitment to whole food plant-based nutrition. And two and a half years after his heart attack, he had another angiogram. Now, in the, surgeon, uh, or in the uh, <clears throat> surgeon's sort of uh, uh, office space, uh, at noontime on the day that I knew earlier that morning Joe had had his follow-up angiogram, I walked over to his door, opened it up, and there he was sitting behind his desk. And I said, Joe, I, do. I understand you had the follow-up angiogram. Could you share that with me? He said, sure. I, th I said, how do you think we're doing? And I said, I think we're doing okay. And so if we go to the next slide now you can see look at the comparison between the left and the right yeah that is stunning because yeah so the, the, the left one looks like it's kind of been eaten up by moths and the right one is just the the, the white track. yeah it's clear now, as a bell now the point i the point i'm going to make here is that when the uh <clears throat> when the see he was young he was what 44 years old so this this plaque was young. When the plaque is young and it's made up of inflammation, fat and cholesterol, the body can do a stunning job with it. Here's a, another example. If we go to the next slide, this is a, now a 45 year old gentleman from Florida. And you can see where the arrow is. This is an obtuse marginal branch of the circumflex artery. And where the arrow is, you can see there's an 80% narrowing there. Now this gentleman had also other blockages which prompted his cardiologist to ask to tell him that what he needed was bypass surgery. But apparently he had bought a copy of the book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease and said no no to his cardiologist I'm not I'm going to try to do this with diet and the cardiologist said no you're wasting your time. So a year went by and the cardiologist uh, with the consent of the patient said decided they'd look at it again. Remember, it was 80% blocked at this time. Let's have the next slide. Now you can see it's 40% blocked. So he was really making some headway with this. So at this point, he changed cardiologists and his new cardiologist a year and a quarter later decided they ought to get another one. Next slide. Wow. There it's all gone. So, you know, it's, it's really a very compelling moment when you think that not one single physician was suggesting or advising it, the patient had to do this himself. And look at what you've got here. With minimal expense, you gotta eat. <laughs> and with minimal expense and no injury, no danger, look what's happened. The patient has absolutely vanquished his disease, which really brings it to the fore. The question of why isn't it that every single patient with cardiovascular disease should at least be offered this uh, perhaps as an option. Now let's go to the next slide. We've talked a little bit about the heart. I wanna mention a word or two here now about the leg. On the left, you see a measurement called the pulse volume. And the pulse volume uh, is in an, on the ankle of this 54 year old gentleman who also had heart disease. And because of this block, partially blocked artery in his thigh, he had to stop while crossing the Skyway to my office. He had to stop uh, five times to let his calf muscle fill up with blood so the cramp would go away. But I was so focused on his heart, I totally forgot about his leg until about 10 months into the program when he said, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I first started seeing you, I had to stop five times while crossing the Skyway to your office? Yeah, I remember, certainly I remember that. He said, you know, in the last month, it got to be four, three, two times, and now I don't stop at all. The pain is gone. I said, well, then, Don, let's do this. Back you go. 
<clears throat> to the vascular lab, and we will repeat the pulse volume. Now look, look what you see on the right. Mm. Think of, it is now pulse volume was doubled, doubled what we had before. We now have suddenly knew at the start of this program, we had absolutely irrefutable scientific rock hard data that food and food alone could absolutely reverse this disease. And if somebody's going to say, well, wait a minute. What about the statin drugs? Well, wait a minute. Look at the date, 1986. We didn't have any statin drugs then. As a matter of fact, when you, if you go to my book, you will see some of our most profound examples of disease reversal occurred in patients who were unable or, do, or who didn't take statins. Next slide. I see. How, ex how excited were you about that pulse volume, seeing the before and the after? Oh, that was it. I mean, yeah. Not only that, see, that correlated with the disappearance of his symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, but that was the first time. Yes. Um, yeah, that was 1986. But that was the first patient. It was that was that before you done any before and after angiograms. That was kind of the oh, first yeah. time you got a sniff that wow, this is working, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what you're seeing now is a uh, is the uh, aorta and some of the iliac vessels uh, in a 78 year old retired high school chemistry teacher. And in his retirement, he and his wife like to enter square dance contest, but <clears throat> during the fast square dance, he was getting bilateral calf pain because of a decrease in blood flow to that part of his leg. So he saw these <clears throat> vascular surgeons and they got these images you see here, and he was not too excited about the big operation that they proposed. And he said, after he came to and had found us and came in for counseling, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I choose your method, how long will it take me to get rid of my calf pain? So I looked at him with great wisdom in my face and I said, well, probably about eight or 10 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. The pain is gone. <laughs> uh, now, uh, so explain to me, what exactly are we looking at here on the screen right now? Well, you're looking at, on the left, uh, yeah. you're looking at a, a visualization of the lower, at the top, it's the lower abdominal aorta, mm -hmm. and then it divides to the right and left leg through the iliac and then the femoral artery and so forth. But what you're seeing on the right is a sort of a concentrated view of the upper part of that which is on the left, namely the lower part of the aorta and where it immediately dot, divides to the right and left artery. And, the, the, and this, they're horribly filled with uh, with plaque and blockages, as you can see. Okay, so is but are we looking at a before and after here, or are we just looking at kind no, of? No, no, no. You're just looking no. at the before. The after is okay. when he called me and said the pain is gone. Got it, got it, got it, got. It. And the and it, and is the is the blockage basically the white? Is that the? Uh, That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Now. I have no idea where this, where this audience is largely is from, but in, the, in Cleveland, Ohio, when you're watching a mystery or a sporting event, just before the advertisement comes on, you will hear the mellifluous tones of the announcer say, next slide, when the moment is right, will you be ready? Now, we all know that the penile artery is much s smaller than the coronary artery to the heart. So not infrequently, before somebody comes down with heart disease, they may find that they're having difficulty raising the flag. However, all is not lost. For instance, not, not infrequently, I'll get a phone call 10 or 11 months after I've counseled somebody, which will go a little bit like uh, this. Uh, and Dr. Esselstyn, yes, this is Mr. So-and-so. Yeah, good to hear your voice. Yeah, Doc, I really thought I ought to give you a call because recently something has come up. And I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. We have the, we have that's, the next one. That's very delicately put. Nice. Could we have the next? That's it. Yeah. Now, here is kind of a, 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 you have to sort of listen a little bit carefully because uh, this is key. What you're looking at here on the left and on the right is what we call a PET scan. And the PET scan measures uh, blood flow to the heart muscle. So, for example, on the figure on the left, where you see orange and yellow, that means there's pretty, de pretty decent blood flow. But as you, on the left, you will see an area of green. 
and the green is what we call ischemia. That's a fancy medical word for poor blood supply. So at the time that he had that PET scan on the left, I counseled him. And then lo and behold, we brought him back three weeks later to repeat the PET scan. And now look on the right. It's almost all orange. And that area that was green before is now being reperfused. Pretty exciting to think that happens in three weeks. Now, the question I was uh, raising about this to myself, I said, wait a minute. Uh, we haven't washed out the blockage or plaque in three weeks. What is going on here? So I consulted with uh, Rodriguez, who is the chairman of cardiovascular pathology at the Cleveland Clinic, who perhaps dissects the hearts from 200 people who are deceased uh, every year. And the question I asked for him, uh, if you can uh, give me the next slide. The question I asked for him, I said, Rod, how often do you ever see blockage or, is, or blockages or plaque? Because as you see on this slide for the audience, you can see those three main coronary arteries. The right coronary artery, the left anterior descending, and the circumflex. Where do they all go? They all go where they're supposed to go. They dive into the heart muscle to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle. Now, it's those three arteries that get all the publicity for stents and bypasses. But I wanted to know from Rodriguez, how often did he ever see, once the artery had dived into the heart muscle, how often did he ever see any blockage or any plaque? His answer, never. So now I knew what was going on. How did we see that change within three weeks? Because when we first see these patients, their endothelial tissues are just so absolutely hmm. compromised and injured. They're barely making the great blood vessel dilator of nitric oxide. And now, believe it or not, they are making your two molecules which are your enemy. They are called endothelin and thromboxane. And endothelin and thromboxane are vasoconstrictors. By that, I mean they tend to narrow the artery, not with a block inside it, but just by being pinched and narrowed by the action of these two molecules of endothelin and thromboxane. Hmm. So what happens then, as soon as these patients suddenly they get it right, they're no longer injuring the endothelial cell. It's striking how rapid that recovery can become because... What happens is, as they start eating correctly, they make more and more nitric oxide, which is the vessel dilator, and they take away the endothelin and thromboxane, which were the vessel constrictors. When that happens, then this entire enormous cascade of intramuscular vessels that you see mm -hmm. interconnecting with each other on this slide, they all open up. <sighs> that means there's a huge increase in the volume of blood. So, for example, if, if we look at uh, Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous is related to the fourth power of the radius. Translation, a tiny increase in diameter in these thousands of vessels is an enormous increase uh, in flow. Now, at this point, I think it would be good to try uh, the next slide. Bingo. We promised we talk, therefore, about these measures of disease reversal. I've shown you the angiogram. It also occurs, you can reverse a stress test. In other words, the patient is, set, uh, is on a treadmill, mm -hmm. and they have an angina, let's say, and then after they've had the treatment, suddenly then that resolves and reverses. I've shown you the PET scan. We've also had situations where we found that Whole food, plant-based nutrition is capable of reversing disease in the carotid arteries that go to the brain. I've shown you the pulse volume reversal. And then, of course, there are the common symptoms of reversal of chest pain, angina, claudication in the calf, and erectile dysfunction. Now, and there's one other that we don't have on there. The PET scan. No, there's one other that, that we don't have on there that should be a bullet point, and that is the ejection fraction. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, the ejection fraction is key. That's the ability of the left heart to propulse, to squeeze 
muscle, heart muscle, and the endothelium is the force of forcing blood out of the ventricle into the aorta. That's yeah. your ejection fraction. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So this is what we're going to do now. Uh, Essie, if you're game, uh, let's throw some questions your way. You, you, good, you good with that? Let's do it. All right. Fantastic. Now, first, I just want to say, because I, I know a lot of you are wondering where you can find a doctor who promotes this whole food, plant-based, uh, so, salt, oil, sugar-free lifestyle in your area. And the answer is simple. Just go to, you know, it's amazing what they're doing these days with telemedicine. Just go to plantbaseddocs.com. They have people that are registered in all 50 states, and, uh, and, and you'll be set. Um, all right. How about if we try and keep the answers pretty lean because we got lots of questions? So, um, Bess, I am just looking here. Uh, well, go ahead, uh, Essie, if you want to answer that question. Will this also help with type 2 diabetes? Oh, yes. That's, it, it's been really, especially in the patients who have been increasingly gain weight and they've become diabetic as they beyond the age of 35 or 40. And uh, if, if you can get to these folks and get them to lose the weight, it's just absolutely wonderful because look, diabetes is horrible. It's an absolute like pouring gasoline on the fire. It's a killer. Yeah. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Yeah. Um, all right, Bess, I'm going to, I'm going to go here to, um, All right. Why don't we do this one? This is from uh, Jeliganis. It starts with high rep. I've been whole food plant-based, no oil for three plus years. Tr my triglycerides are over 200. I'm not doing smoothies or alcohol, but I do eat a lot of fruit. Could it be familial combined hyperlipidemia? Doctor is stumped. Thank you. What do you think, Essie? Well, what was the, uh, what was 200? They're triglycerides. They want to get yeah, that. Oh, yeah. No, let's, yeah. What, to really get to the bottom of this as quickly as we can, see if you can't go uh, almost uh, two and a half weeks or so without, without any fruit, just without any fruit. See what that does for your triglycerides. Because as remember, it's the simple carbohydrates that tend to jack up your triglycerides, things like alcohol, smoothies, lots of fruit, fruit juices, and so forth. Sounds like you're getting a lot of fruit. Okay. Uh, Essie. Uh, Jacqueline Fitzgerald wants to know is one drink of beer or wine, four ounces. Okay. With dinner. Yeah. If it's, if it's one night a week, there you go. One night a week. Right. Yeah. Just so everybody knows we, we, we're, we're not a fan of alcohol. You know, it's basically empty calories and, uh, well, it's a toxin. It's a toxin to the brain. It's toxic to your heart. It's toxic to your liver. Yeah. Uh, Julie Steiner says, why do you not recommend statin drugs? I don't know if that's an accurate statement. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think I've said that you can't. I just said that if let me put, put this in perspective. Uh, the statin drugs have made a contribution. But how many statin drugs do they t suppose they take in Okinawa, rural China and Central Africa where they don't have any heart disease? Mm -hmm. None. They don't need it. Now, once you have heart disease, wouldn't it be sensible to really change the whole food plant-based nutrition? But many patients can't or won't do that. So the easiest cop-out for a physician is to write them a script for statin, which will help lower their cholesterol and, and, and improve their uh, outlook. But let me just say that uh, there are many patients who have come through our uh, seminar that I conduct once a month, many patients who have come through who simply learned long before they ever heard of me, that they simply couldn't take a statin. Mm -hmm. Because they, uh, they couldn't take a statin because of severe muscle cramps, or it was injuring their liver, or it was giving them diabetes, or it was giving them brain fog. And yet, as you'll see in the pictures in the book, some of the most profound examples that we've had of disease reversal have occurred in patients who were unable to take a statin, but fully were compliant with, the, uh, with our program. So I... Uh, I think the statins certainly have a place, uh, but I don't think that anybody should feel that they're uh, being abandoned if they can't get their cholesterol down. Even if they're, let's suppose they're following our program 100% and they still have a cholesterol of 180, 190, 200, 210, they're going to be fine. 
if they're completely eating plant-based because then they're building what we call an endothelial fortress, an endothelial fortress. And uh, so that's kind of the uh, yeah. way on, I feel on the, uh, on the statins. Good. Um, I've heard you say, Essie, too, that with the statins, uh, you know, you referred to as kind of whole food plant-based as the, the, the belt and then statins as a, kind of the suspenders kind of help them. Uh, Maria Matthews has a question. This came in at one thirty. Bess. What about old plaque? Can that be reversed? Well, it's going to be more stubborn because old plaque, which has been there for decades, is going to be more made up of fibrosis, scar, and calcification. But even, even those patients, interestingly enough, can often get back to full uh, daily activity without restriction uh, because of what I just went through earlier. When all those intracardiac, that is the vessels that are intramuscular, once the blood vessels have dived into the muscle, all those, all those tiny vessels that don't have a plaque in them, but they're pinched, they're narrowed, they all open up. And that's why these, even these patients who may have a more stubborn, a more stubborn uh, plaque in the major vessels, uh, they, they often get beautifully symptom-free. Okay. I'm just going to read a, uh, a, little, a little shout out and testimonial here. This came in at 146, uh, Bess from Lorlor Perella. She says, uh, Essie, my cholesterol went from 282 to 147, triglycerides 205 to 72, LDL 189 to 94, my A1C from 6.5 to 4.2, all from whole food plant-based uh, salt oil, sugar-free lifestyle. And I also lost 80 pounds. I'm celebrating my second year anniversary on March 26th. You, Dr. Esselstyn, are the reason why I am so successful as I have learned from you. I absolutely adore you. Thank you. Do you ever get sick and tired Thank of hearing, those, hearing that? <laughs> Thank you. No, I think that's what kind of keeps us going as long as we can get people to turn around. Yeah. The challenge, the challenge remains because have you ever looked at, ever looked at what kind of food is advertised on TV? Yeah. So I this is saw cheese string and pull <laughs> as much without ever breaking on TV. They get some sort of cheese. It just keeps stretches and yeah. stretches and stretches. So, uh, best, this came in at 146. It's uh shoe Khan. So I there's a lot of talk about nuts, obviously, you know, you yeah, yeah, yeah. know that you're not a fan of nuts, but, she wants to know, is almond milk okay for someone with heart disease? Oh, yeah. Like on a calcium screening. Oh, yeah. Doc said non-obstructive heart disease. What are your no, thoughts on yeah. almond milk? I'm all for it. I okay. Say, especially low-fat almond. Yeah. And, and let me explain that. Let me, let me explain a, a, a word about nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do that, and then I'll explain about almond milk. Uh, fair enough. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm a little bit slow on nuts, nuts have a lot of saturated fat, Okay. And saturated fat is the last thing you want to do for your heart. The other thing is that I have yet to see a single study of patients who are seriously ill with heart disease where by giving them a diet of nuts that they're able to show absolute disease reversal. I just haven't, haven't seen that. There also is a study that often is overlooked because it's an old one back in the 1970s when Dr. Veselinovich and his team took rhesus monkeys, three groups. One group was getting corn oil, the other was getting butter fat, and the other was getting peanut oil. Now, then, sadly, they sacrificed the animals after a year. The vessels in those having peanut oil were far and away much more destroyed and ravaged than the other groups. Okay. So what I was going to say about the... Uh, so let's... A small handful of almonds, one ounce is about 180 calories. Almond milk, you're lucky if 2% of that is coming from almonds. And it's got about 35 calories, 40 calories per serving. So the amount of fat and the amount of calories is very minuscule compared to actual almonds themselves. Essie, I'm going to take a quick question. This came in at 148 from Cindy Dudak. And the question is about salt intake because uh, there's 210 milligrams uh, per serving in our Indian lentil stew. And she wants to know if that's too high. Can I get feedback? So the most important thing here, Cindy, is, and it's a great question, is 
the totality of your sodium intake over the course of the day. And if you're eating, as my father has suggested, whole food plant-based, but you're also supplementing with some of, let's say, our plant-strong products, our cereals, our stews, our chilies, uh, which are some of the lowest sodium products on the market, you'll be absolutely fine. And remember, the Institute of Medicine wants your total milligrams of sodium over the course of the day to be less than 1500 milligrams. Right. So if you were to eat that whole container, that's 420 milligrams. You've got, you know, eating fresh fruit and vegetables, you know, that's maybe got a, a total of 400 to 500. You should be absolutely fine. Uh, would you agree with all that, Essie? Oh yeah. That's that you got to keep it low. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> Uh, this came in at 151 best is from Kyle Ewing. What is the recommended amount of B12 to take while following whole food plant-based? What are your thoughts on B12? Uh, between the ages of, of 50, excuse me, between the ages of 60 and 70, maybe 500 micrograms over 70, a thousand micrograms. Why? Well, I, I had a favorite physician who was an expert in B12. who convinced me that the last thing you ever want to have happen to your patients to have B12 deficiency, you get anemia and then you get some irreversible neurological damage, which is really something you don't want anybody to have. Because as we grow older, there are two valuable, valuable things in the stomach that are so essential for the absorption of B12. One is gastric acid. Gastric acid tends to fall off as we get older. And the other thing we tend to lose is intrinsic factor, which is essential for the absorption of B12. So that's why he suggests a thousand micrograms uh, a day uh, over the age of 70. Okay. Uh, this came in at 145 best. It's from Shivam Pandi. Uh, Dr. Justin, do you think there's a link between oral hygiene and heart health? Yes. There's no question that if you, are, if you have a disease, gums, if they're, they're unhealthy, uh, obviously this is going to somehow adversely impact the health of your endothelial cells. All right. Love, love it. Uh, best 45, Philip Ramirez thoughts on red rice yeast extract in place of statins. Yeah, I think this is, this is probably uh, something that's okay. Okay. All right. Um, Essie, what do you think is more toxic salt or sugar? <laughs> it's a question of whether you want to be shot or hung. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I don't think we want either. Um, what do you, this is came in at 143 from Lynn Huffman. My cardiologist is very supportive of plant-based. What are your thoughts on familial hypercholesterolemia? Can you still have high LDL and plant-based and be as healthy as possible? Yeah, it's, it's going to be challenging, but it's interesting that you can, when you often you take care of these patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, and there are other relatives in that family that have re really, even with that uh, impact of cholesterol, have, uh, have done very well. I like those patients who have a high cholesterol to do the best they can with whole food plant-based nutrition. And it's interesting that the basis for developing heart disease, of course, is inflammation. So that let's say that you can't keep your cholesterol below the 240 or 250, but if you are in no way creating an inflammatory an inflammation environment, let's say, for instance, if how do you know that you're being successful with that? You can get blood studies of inflammation. For instance, you can get a blood drawn and measure your oxidized LDL. You can look at asymmetric dimethyl arginine. You can look at uh, MPO, which is myeloperoxidase. And there's also uh, uh, TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, and lastly, uh, HSCRP. Those are all studies of inflammation. And if those are always nice and low and safe, even if your cholesterol is high, that means you've got sort of what I call an endothelial fortress and you should be doing the very best you can to keep yourself from getting uh, disease progression. And then there are, there, are, uh, there are also for these patients some injectable, injectable co uh, compounds for lowering cholesterol. Okay. Um, 123, Roger Gridvec, this is just another testimonial. 
I have lost 100 pounds in one year and got rid of my type 2 diabetes by switching to a low-fat plant-based uh, food. Good for you. That's awesome. Um, Esty, it seems to be that there's a fair amount of conversation about coffee, caffeine, green tea. Can you repeat your thoughts on that? Well, I, uh, I'm a little bit cautious about, and again, I'm a bit of an outlier here, but I, uh, I don't like to have coffee with caffeine. And I'll tell you the reason for that. That, uh, I mean, I, by the way, well, I, green tea and black tea and, and uh, decaffeinated are fine. But the reason I have reservations about coffee with caffeine is an Italian study. It's a good study where a group of healthy young patients was persons, participants was divided in half. Half drank coffee with caffeine, the other was decaf. And then after they drank, they did the uh, brachial artery tourniquet test, which is a measurement of endothelial activity, activity. Then they switched groups. And the group that previously was having coffee with caffeine was now decaf. And interestingly enough, it was always the group that was having coffee with caffeine that injured endothelial output of nitric oxide. Okay. So the other reason, see, the reason that, that my program succeeds where others may occasionally fail is because nobody else is as mean as I am. <laughs> well, I've never thought you were mean. I just thought you were very intense and you occasionally could be very stern. <laughs> um, all right. There's, there's you guys, I just love all these questions. And, um, I want to say that we so appreciate you guys being so interested in taking your health to the next level. Um, Essie, what about, uh, avocados? Somebody here wants to know, uh, how is it that avocados damage the endothelial cells? Yeah. It's, again, it's interesting that I, where was it the other day? I was just reading again how avocado was contributing to some, some hypertension. And uh, it, has, it has obviously a lot of fats, but it, the one that I want to get rid of is the uh, saturated fat. Uh, so I just think it's in the, uh, it's in the, card, the corridor of foods that I would just assume uh, people not have because of injury to the uh, endothelium. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. And if you look at the breakdown nutritionally of an avocado, it is about 80% fat and 15% of that fat is coming from saturated fat. Yeah. And again, you're, you're a stickler about that. Um, so there's, there's, there's a, been a few questions too about how we as human beings, we need a certain amount of fat to absorb the fat soluble vitamins. What's your thought on that? Uh, and how, and I, I know you recommend you know, a pretty low fat, less than 10% of your calories coming from fat on your disease re or heart disease reversal program. Uh, and you think that's ample, correct? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. There's, I don't think we've ever heard of anybody who went into the emergency room and said, my God, help me out. I'm fat deficient. Right. Uh, it's interesting that just within the last year or two, uh, in some leading medical journals, one is a, in the New England Journal of Medicine, the other was in the uh, American the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing was that these were a, gr a group of very responsible physicians. And the discussion was really sort of focusing around supplements. And the, pretty much the, it was uniformly agreed that that presently is an industry that is totally out of control. And you really don't, when you get a supplement, you don't really know what it is that you're getting that's in, this, in that bottle or in that pill. And the consensus was that uh, perhaps by, by, by this is my uh, introduction here about B12, with the exception of B12, you should be able to get all of your uh, nutrients, vitamins and minerals from a nice variety of healthful fo foods. Okay. Um, you know what? We're, we're at the top of the hour, Essie. And so we're going uh, we're, we're gonna to call it right now. I so appreciate everybody joining. I apologize if we haven't gotten to your to your question. Uh, I do want to just go, give a little plug to we're doing our first retreat of 2023 in Black Mountain, April 16th to 21st. 
And if anybody's interested in joining us in the gorgeous, lush mountains of Black Mountain, that's about 25 miles from Asheville, North Carolina, check us out on plantstrong.com. Essie, would you like to say a, a word about your program that you offer to people with that are concerned about heart disease uh, once a month? Well, sure. What it, is, what it is that we try to reach out uh, to patients who either, for instance, one, let's say that they've had a heart attack, they don't want to have another one, or they've got a lot of symptoms of heart disease, and they've been told they have to have stents, or they've been told they have to have bypass, but they don't want to have it. Uh, in other words, the, the entire spectrum of people who have that kind of cardiovascular disease, we really love to see them. What the way the program works is it's a uh, it's a one single day, five hours. We limit it to people who are let's say no more than eighteen or twenty folks. They're going to learn all about how they have created their disease and precisely how we are going to empower them as the locus of control to halt uh, and to re uh, to reverse their disease. And since I'm a little bit old fashioned, when my secretary gives me a list of who's coming two weeks beforehand, I personally call every one of the patients to get my arms around their story. Uh, and at the same time, provide them with an opportunity to ask questions of me so that coming to the seminar, we have a strong platform from which we can all move forward. So when you think about it, there, there's a total number of hours of close to close to six hours of information so that they're really going to uh, get their arms around this disease and know how to handle it. Right. Um, and just to repeat everybody, cause I see a lot of comments. Um, will this be replayed? Yeah. You can go to our YouTube channel, go plan strong mm -hmm. and we'll have this up within, uh, within 30 minutes of, uh, of shutting this, shutting this off. All right, everybody, you guys keep it plan strong. We're rooting and tooting for you all mm -hmm. the way. Uh, you can do it. Essie, thank you for sharing with us the nine different ways that you have shown reversal of <laughs> coronary artery disease over the course of the last 39 years. It's so absolutely impressive and empowering. Thank you. Thank you, Rip. All right. Talk to you soon, everybody. Bye. -bye.